Science. CNN uh, Evan Perez joins us with the latest. So, an executive order from the acting attorney general to the Justice Department. What are the details? Well, Anderson, this is an extraordinary order from the, the, from the acting attorney general, Sally Yates. Uh, she's ordering the Justice Department lawyers not to defend uh, this executive order that the, uh, the president, the new president, Donald Trump, issued on Friday with regard to refugees and immigration. Uh, she says in her order to the Justice Department lawyers that she does not believe uh, that this order is lawful. That's a big deal for the government because now they're facing challenges in at least five jurisdictions, five states right now. Anderson, uh, where judges are, are hearing challenges to whether or not this law, this, uh, this executive order from the president is legal. And, and what she said, and I'll read you a little piece of, of what she said in, in her order. She says, uh, I am responsible for ensuring that the positions we take in court co remain consistent with this institution's solemn obligation to always seek justice and stand for what is right. At present, I am not convinced that the defense of the executive order is consistent with these responsibilities, nor am I convinced that the executive order is lawful. So, Anderson, what happens next? We don't know. Uh, the, the president has the right to fire the acting attorney general, uh, but then the, she is really the only one left inside the, the Justice Department uh, who Senate confirmed uh, and who could sign off on uh, surveillance warrants, inter international surveillance warrants, uh, and that's a big deal for the government. So her uh, statement is really only in effect to the, to the effect that it's in effect. It's only in effect until the acting attorney general leaves office, wherein right. Jeff Sessions will then be sworn in. Right. The assumption has been that Jeff Sessions was going to be confirmed as Attorney General later this week. Uh, we don't know whether or not that changes. If this, uh, we know that, uh, we, that the, for instance, some of the Republicans on the Hill, on Capitol Hill, have been uncomfortable with some parts of this executive order, especially uh, because it wasn't briefed to them before, uh, they, before the president signed it. A lot of people did not see this, including Sally Yates, and she struggled with this uh, over the weekend, uh, Anderson. That's what I'm told uh, by sources at the Justice Department. And so finally today she issued this order to uh, Justice Department lawyers that they were not going to defend this, at least until the new attorney general uh, takes office. All right, Evan Press, thanks very much. We should point out President Trump just tweeted, and I quote, the Democrats are delaying my cabinet picks for purely political reasons. They have nothing going but to obstruct. Now have an Obama AG. Let's bring in some legal expertise. Joining us is CNN legal analyst Laura Coates, a former federal prosecutor, also constitutional attorney Paige Pate, and Harvard's Alan Dershowitz. Professor Der Dershowitz, what do you make uh, of the acting attorney general's decision, and how does this actually play out? Jim is here in the West Wing with a packet when we moved in telling us the history of our office, so I thought that was really fascinating. But the recent history of this office, just to tell you my immediate predecessors, Valerie Jarrett, of course, probably the closest advisor to President Obama, who also served him all eight years. As she told me when I came here to have lunch with her last month, Martha, she arrived on day one and she left with him on the very final day. That's really rare, particularly for somebody at that senior level. Before Valerie Jarrett had this office, it was occupied by Fox News' Carl Rove course, often referred to as President George W. Bush's, quote, brain. And before that, this one's really fascinating, First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton occupied this White House. Of course, the First Ladies have their offices in the East Wing, but she, Hillary Clinton, as First Lady, of course, wanted to be immediately and deeply involved in policy, so she had an office in the West Wing, and it was this one. The good omen of all that is that each of those people, Valerie Jarrett, Karl Rove, and Hillary Clinton, served a two-term president. So I like, I'm going to keep the trend up. That's yes. the karma there, right? In terms of the women who are in leadership roles in the Trump administration, you look back on the march that we saw the day after the president was inaugurated and very anti-Trump in, in the course of that protest. Talk to us about what it's like to be a woman in the Trump administration, in the Trump White House. Well, in some ways, it feels like just being one of the men is being one of the women, meaning we're all treated the same by President Trump. But there is a special responsibility. I do feel like I have a vaunted platform, if you will, and a special responsibility to America's women, particularly those who write to me, email me, call me, text me, stop me on the streets or anywhere I really am. Martha, just to say thank you so much for standing up to standing up for women and standing up to other women and other people who are trying to diminish the President of the United States. I feel like we're the ones who extend the olive branch quite a bit and then you have Democrats just today in the Senate saying they will quote block any Supreme Court nominee that Donald Trump puts up. They don't even know the person's name yet. They haven't even met him or her. 
and they've already committed themselves to obstructing and blocking and filibustering that person. So Donald Trump has promised to be the president of all Americans. He's making good on that already. Even those who are protesting him will benefit from his job creation, his wage boosting, his energy and infrastructure investments. But at the same time, it would be good for people to get out of the business of permanent protesting and actually try to find a way to work together. So you bring up the SCOTUS nomination, which we expect tomorrow evening. Democrats could easily say, and in fact they have, well, we're taking this action because that's exactly what Mitch McConnell did to the president's uh, nomination of Garland. Well, but that was different. That was knowing that the president only had uh, less than a year left on his term. And that was not unprecedented in terms of letting the next president, who they all thought would be Hillary Clinton, in fairness, let the next president put his or her Supreme Court nominee up there. The fact is, when there were vacancies for presidents that had more time in their remaining administrations, Martha, uh, they were not filibustered. Do you support, if Senator McConnell wants to push forward the nuclear option, is that something the White House supports? Well, we should take a look at all of our options, and I think uh, Harry Reid probably, now retired, but probably uh, regrets the day that he went so nuclear with the nuclear option because now his party is no longer in power in the United States Senate, obviously. But uh, Senator McConnell, Leader McConnell, has been very public in expressing his confidence that President Trump's Supreme Court nominee will be confirmed. Senator Leader McConnell did a great job, frankly, in keeping that that seat vacant. But you see the resistance that's out there that you just spoke of. So in terms of the nuclear option, when Harry Reid put it through, he did it excluding the Supreme Court for other things, but not for the Supreme Court. So McConnell would have to add the Supreme Court to that as also part of the nuclear option. Do you think that's what he's going to do? That, well, that's up to Leader McConnell and his colleagues. Would you be supportive of I that? I'm, sub I'm supportive of a fair and full process. President Obama spoke out today for the first time really since he left office and he spoke out about the travel ban that was enacted over the course of the weekend and he said the president fundamentally disagrees with the notion of discriminating against individuals based on their faith or religion and he believes that American values are at stake in this decision. What do you think about him speaking out so early on and in the way that he did? He's welcome to say what he wants. It's a free country, including for ex-presidents. But let's let's back it up a second. President Trump would agree with exactly what you just said there, the first part, which is that we don't believe anybody should be discriminated according to their religion or whatever he said, um, in addition to what he said. That's not what this is. This is temporary. It is 90 days, and it is very narrowly restricted to seven countries that none other than President Obama's administration identified as high risk for harboring, training, and exporting terrorists. He's but I, being hypocritical and criticizing it? I, he's welcome to say what he wants. What I think is he, everybody should be reminded it was his list originally, number one. And number two, Martha, that you know when you're as powerful as an ex-president or a current sitting senator, and you say or do anything that could possibly mislead people into believing that something has an impact and an effect that it clearly does not, it, it's a dangerous game. In terms of the NSC meetings, we just saw Sean Spicer come out earlier and clarify a few points. He said that Steve Bannon will not be at all of those meetings. Um, in, in the directive, it, it said that he would, would be attending all of those meetings, no? Well, I spoke directly with the President about this today, and Sean, who's doing an amazing job as our Press Secretary, went out there today and said, this is very similar to 2001, 2017, 2009. So when you had the three last new presidents, if you will, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, basically those all said the same thing with respect to the NSC, that um, someone like Steve Bannon, very akin to David Axelrod for President Obama, Martha, they will come in and out of the meetings as needed and as directed by the president, who of course has the final say over everything we do here. Uh, president Trump took it another step today. He restored or, or initiated putting his CIA director, Mike Pompeo, in those meetings as well as part of the NSC. And of course, I believe when President Bush was president, we did not have a DNI, Director of National Intelligence. That's a semi-new um, office, and that's former Senator Dan Coats. Of course, he'll be involved in that. So you talk about the NSC, I think that when people think of C. Bannon, being in those meetings um, here and there, it would be like Dave, what David Axelrod said his role was. He was not there as a matter of course, but he was there. And of course, the Joint Chiefs of Staff will be represented there as well. Okay. Kellyanne, thank you very thank much. Thank you so much, Martha. Thanks Stop by. I'll have pictures on the wall. I thank promise. You. <laughs> 
So still ahead tonight, Tucker Carlson will join us on the breaking news that the Justice Department is not going to defend President Trump on his travel ban. Plus, less than one day until the Senate votes on the nomination for Betsy DeVos for Education Secretary. Here is a massive 11th hour effort that is underway to block that confirmation. We have reaction from Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers, and then Bill Bennett, former Education Secretary under President Reagan. She does not have any understanding of public schools, and she is the worst thing that could happen to our children, my fellow teachers, and the profession as a whole. Breaking tonight, we are less than 24 hours away from a Senate committee that will set that will be set to vote on the nomination for Betsy DeVos as Secretary of Education. Progressives from around the country are in the midst of a last-ditch effort to block.